Okay, so we are super excited to have Bill Rancic here with us today. Many of you may know Bill from as long ago as over, over 10 years ago now when Bill was the first winner of The Apprentice by Donald Trump. Um, super exciting, and before that, he has a lot of experience which helped get him on the show, entrepreneurial experience, real estate experience, and of course, after winning the show, then went and worked for the Trump Organization. So excited to hear a little bit about that. And since then, I mean, Bill's been involved a little bit here and there, everywhere. Um, he's had a reality show, Juliana and Bill, with his wife. Um, and he has opened a new restaurant in Chicago, which we were just talking about, RPM Italian. He's doing some other real estate ventures. He is a, um, an anchor on America Now. Is that the, the term, anchor, or the host? Host? So we'll let him talk about himself. Without further ado, Bill Rancic. My sister works for me, and she handles a lot of these speaking engagements that, that I do, and she can't say no to people. So someone from the Delta Gamma sorority called up my sister and asked her if I would come and speak at Purdue University, and, and she said I would. So I was actually kind of excited. I was going back to a college town. I thought it'd be a lot of fun. And I recruited two of my buddies to come with me, and, and we were walking out the door, heading to the plane. And as we're walking out the door, my wife stopped us, and, and she started laughing. And she says, you know, guys, they're going to think you're there for parents' weekend. <laughs> and it turned out she was right, because when I got there, I was at the Delta Gamma sorority house, and I was doing a, a meet and greet, and this young lady came running up to me, and, and she was going on and on how she loved watching me on The Apprentice and never missed an episode, and just on and on and on. And I had this big ear-to-ear -ear grin on my face. And, and then she went on to say that she was in seventh grade when the show was on. <laughs> Made me feel really old really fast, but. Uh, it got me to thinking that it was almost 10 years ago uh, that that first season of the show aired. And for me, it's been great because I've gotten to travel to different parts of the country and, and different parts of the world. And, and wherever I go, it's funny, people will stop me and, and they'll ask me the same two questions. The first question they always want to know, as you can probably imagine, is Donald Trump's hair real? Of course, uh, I have to say that it is. Uh, but the, <laughs> it is, it is. I've been in a helicopter with him, it's real. Uh, but the second question they want to know is if I, if I knew I was going to win that competition show when we first started taping. And I have to be honest, I had no idea. You know, I was competing with 15 other contestants. We had guys from Harvard and Yale and all these fancy business schools. I was just a, a small entrepreneur from Chicago. I tell them I didn't know where I was going to stack up in the mix. Uh, but I got to let them know that if they were to ask my mom, my mom claimed she knew I was going to win The Apprentice when I was 10 years old. And it all began on my parents' anniversary weekend. You see, my mom and dad were going out of town to celebrate their wedding anniversary, and they wanted to spend some quality time alone. So they decided they were going to send me off to my grandmother's for the weekend. And I wasn't happy about it, but I went. And I woke up Saturday morning, and, and there was my grandmother in the kitchen. She was making breakfast. And I was very inquisitive as a young man. I would always ask a million questions. So I started inundating my grandmother with all these questions. And she decided she was going to pull me in the kitchen and she was gonna teach me how to cook. So I spent six hours in my grandmother's kitchen mastering the art of making pancakes. I could make any kind of pancake out there. So I went to bed that night and I woke up Sunday morning and I popped out of bed and I raced into her kitchen and the first thing I did is I picked up her telephone and I invited all the old ladies who lived on my grandmother's block to come over for a pancake breakfast. Well, these women loved it. They thought it was the neatest thing they'd ever seen. Cooked them their breakfast, they left. And after they left, I, I made a very interesting discovery. You see, I started clearing their plates away from the table, and I discovered that each and every one of these ladies left a $5 bill underneath her plate. I thought, huh, I'm onto something here. So I did what I thought was perfectly normal. I took the money, I put it in my pocket, and I kept my mouth shut. Didn't say a word to anybody. I went back home, and the week went by. And Friday afternoon, that school bus dropped me off in front of my parents' house. And I went blazing in the front door, demanding that my mom take me to my grandmother's for the weekend. 
Well, this went on for the next five weeks, and my mom couldn't quite understand this new relationship that I'd formed with my grandmother, or I guess I should say partnership that I'd formed with my grandmother. And then my mom was in my room one day, and she was putting something in one of my drawers, and she made a, a rather interesting discovery of her own. She found a stack of $5 bills hidden underneath my socks, and she became rather alarmed, as any good mother would, and she sat me down and immediately demanded to know where all this money had come from, and I had to fess up that I was running a makeshift restaurant out of my grandmother's house. <laughs> my mom put that business to an end immediately. She claimed I was fleecing these old ladies out of their social security checks. <laughs> but when I look back on that experience, you know, whether I knew it or not at the age of 10, I possessed a trait that is so important in anyone who wants to be a successful entrepreneur. And it's having the ability to recognize an opportunity, but more importantly, seizing that opportunity. And I think that's why everyone's here today because you're taking advantage of an opportunity. But most people go through life and they see opportunity all around them. It's the very few, it's the one percenters, and I know that term has become unpopular with this last election, but it's the one percenters that actually reach out, grab a hold of it, and do something with it. So that was my start to becoming Trump's uh, very first apprentice. It began with pancakes in my grandmother's kitchen. And uh, just to give you a little background, I grew up in Chicago in a very middle class family. Both of my parents were school teachers. So I worked my way through college with a small business that I had started. And, and then I got out of college and I took a job selling commodity metals for a company. And I'd been on the job, oh, I guess about three months, and, and something happened that had a real impact uh, on why I became an entrepreneur. And, and I'm sure many of you have had stories similar to this happen to you. There was a fellow who'd been with this company for 30 years. He was the first guy in the office. He was the last guy to leave. And he had built this business from the ground up with the two owners. And he came into work one day, and the two owners were, were sitting in his office waiting for him, and they fired this guy on the spot. After 30 years of service, they sent this guy packing. And I watched him pack up all of his personal belongings in his office, and, and they marched the guy out to the parking lot, and, and I watched his car pull out of that parking lot and hit me right here. And I said, I'm never gonna let that happen to me. And I left the office that day determined to get back in touch with my entrepreneurial spirit. And I started networking with everyone I could. I called every friend I had, letting them know that I wanted to start a new business. And I'll never forget the first business I looked at because it was almost my last. My buddy Kyle called me up. He said, Bill, I've got a friend of a friend of a friend who's selling this bar on the west side of Chicago. He's looking to relocate. And I think he can buy this thing at a great price. Well, I was thrilled. I said, Kyle, set up an appointment for me on Saturday. I'll be there at noon. So Saturday comes and I get in my car and I'm driving over to this bar on the west side of Chicago. And, and as I'm driving over to the bar, I'm envisioning myself as the next Sam Malone from Cheers. Those kids at Purdue had no idea who the hell Sam Malone was. Again, made me feel really old. And I pull in the parking lot of this bar and, and I'm immediately alarmed because I see the name of the bar above the door. Now for some reason, my buddy had only given me the address. He didn't mention the name and I didn't think anything and I see the name above the door, these big letters, and the name, the name of the bar was the Aftermath. Slightly concerned, but I open up the door of the Aftermath, and, and there's the owner of the place. He was the fastest talking salesman I'd ever met. And he puts his arm around me, and he's showing me around, telling me how I'm gonna be a millionaire if I buy this place. And as I take a few steps in, I look around, and, and I realize that the Aftermath was no ordinary bar. The Aftermath was a bondage bar. I'd never been in one of these places, and hopefully neither have you. And I'm looking at these different contraptions and torture devices that they have in there. And I'm trying to think, how am I gonna get out of this place alive, right? This is, this is gonna be interesting. So I decide, I'm gonna give him the courtesy of a walkthrough. Just pretend like I'm interested. And he's showing me around, very enthusiastic fellow. And then he takes me into what was the big money maker in the bar, and it was the, what he called the dungeon room in the basement. So as I'm walking through the dungeon room, it hits me. I really want to be involved in a business venture where my family can help me. And I don't think my 65-year-old mother's going to want to work the dungeon room at 4 in the morning on a Saturday. But I kept searching and searching, looking for that right opportunity to take advantage of after I left there. And about six months into my search, I was sitting at this outdoor cafe, and these three European guys sat down at the table next to me, and they pulled out the biggest cigars I'd ever seen and they were smelling these cigars and the way they were lighting these cigars, this idea hit me like a bolt of lightning. I'm gonna create the first ever Cigar of the Month Club. No one had ever done this. Every month I'll send out five beautiful hand-rolled cigars to people's houses. 
I'll generate a newsletter to educate them on these products that I'm sending them, and I thought people may want to give this as a gift. So I'll put a little gift card in there as well. So I left the, the cafe and I went over to my buddy John's house and I pitched him on the idea, and he was on board. So we decided we we're gonna become business partners. We pooled our resources together and between the two of us, we had $24,000, that was it. So we decided to make our corporate headquarters in my buddy's 400 square foot studio apartment. It's about the size of the stage that I'm standing on. And we pushed his bed in the corner and I got some used desks and some used computers. And I got seven 1-800 phone lines piped into this little apartment. And we were ready to get this business up and running. But there was one thing I had to do. I had to go in and I had to quit my job at that metals company. And I went in there and I sat down with the two owners and I looked them square in the eye and I said, I'm gonna be a millionaire one day. And this is my idea. And you know what they did? They laughed. They said, a cigar of the month club? That is the most ridiculous idea we've ever heard. It's so ridiculous, we're gonna keep your office here because when you run out of money in six weeks, we're gonna hire you back with a 20% pay cut. <laughs> Not quite the words of encouragement I was hoping for from these guys, but boy, I was mad as hell. How many people have been told that they couldn't do something in this room, right? You're starting your businesses, you're going into the real estate game, people probably laughed at you. So I'm driving back to that little apartment where our office was and, and I knew I had to be an innovator. I had to figure out a way to reach as many people as I could and get them to pick up that phone and call that 1-800 number. And my $24,000 was now down to about nine, so I knew that wasn't gonna buy me much of an advertising campaign. So I decided to try something a little bit different. I sat down at that used computer that I got and, and I typed a letter explaining how the Cigar of the Month Club worked and at the end of the letter, I asked for help. And I took the letter and I put it inside of an envelope and I took the envelope and I put it inside of a box because I knew a box would always get opened well before an envelope. And I put some cigars in that box. And then as crazy as this may sound, I went to a local costume shop and I bought a pair of these thick Coke bottle nerd glasses that you would wear on Halloween. And I taped a little note right on the bridge of those glasses. And the note read, please take a closer look at my business idea. And I put the glasses on top of the cigars that were on top of that envelope. And I sealed this box up and I made 10 of them and I sent them out to the top 10 morning radio shows in Chicago. And about a week after I sent those boxes out, I got a call, and I'll never forget this day. It was a call from the producer of the number one morning drive radio show in Chicago. It was the Jonathan Brandmeier morning radio show. And this producer called me up and she said, Brandmeier will have you on his show for five minutes. She said, make your five minutes count. And everyone in this room who's in sales knows the value of five minutes. Sometimes it can be the difference between winning and losing. So I go to the radio station the day I'm supposed to and, and I meet this Brandmeier guy and I hit it off instantly with him. And my five minutes turned into 35 minutes at the heart of morning rush hour when everyone's in their car listening to their radios. And this Brandmeier guy was going on and on about the Cigar of the Month Club, saying he's been a member for years. <laughs> I just kind of kept quiet, giving it to all of his brothers for Christmas and they loved it. And this guy was going on and on and on. But he continually gave out our 1-800 number every 15 or 20 seconds. So I finished the interview and I, I left the John Hancock Tower where the studio was in Chicago. And I, could never, I couldn't get a cab that day. For some reason there was a huge convention going on and, and I had to sprint back to the apartment where our office was. And I swing the door open and I'm all out of breath and, and I see my partner and he has one phone on his left ear, one on his right ear. Every phone we have is ringing in there. And I leap over and I grab the first phone I can get my hands on and I take an order from this woman and she orders a 12 month subscription to the Cigar of the Month Club at $34 a month. And I had to pause and I had to ask her, are you sure lady? That's a heck of a commitment. And I hung up the phone and I looked over at my buddy John. I said, John, it looks like we're gonna be in business for at least a year because I just took a 12 month subscription that we need to fulfill. Recognizing opportunity and seizing, being an innovator, that worked. So I took that same letter and those glasses and I sent them to radio stations in New York and Los Angeles and Detroit. And sure enough, all these radio stations were having me on the air, and it wasn't costing me a penny. I was doing something a little bit different. I was bucking the system. It was a non-traditional way of reaching my customers. So when you're an innovator, when you're an entrepreneur, you always try to take a good idea and make it better, make it more efficient, make it more profitable. And I thought to myself, this works with the radio stations, but how can I make it better? What can I do to take it to the next level? And I thought, well, if it works with radio, 
television, right? It seems like the next logical step. I was convinced I was gonna get on Oprah. I thought I'm gonna sit on that couch, we're gonna have a cigar together, we're gonna talk about what a great gift this will make for the holidays. So I, I modified the letter a little bit, I went to that local costume shop and I bought every pair of those Coke bottle glasses I could get my hands on and I made 50 of these packages. And I sent them out to every single daytime talk show on television. You name it, they got a package. A week went by and I didn't get a call. Two weeks go by, I didn't get one call from that wave of packages. And then finally Thursday, the third week, I finally got my first call, but it wasn't quite the call that I'd hoped for. Uh, I got a call from the producers of the Danny Bonaducci daytime talk show. You guys remember Danny Bonaducci? He was Danny Partridge from the Partridge family. He had a daytime talk show that was on the air for six weeks. It was nationally syndicated. I managed to get on that show twice in the six weeks this guy was on the air. But then I got on Good Morning America, and I got on CNN, and within the first 30 days, I had those 1-800 phone lines piped in that little apartment. We had over 1,000 members getting these cigars sent to their home each and every month. And then Father's Day came, and we had 4,000 members getting these things sent to their home every month. And then the next holiday season came, and we had 8,000 members getting these sent. And it kept growing and growing and growing, and life was good. I mean, you guys could do the math. But then it was the late 90s, and the world changed. Uh, the dot-com boom started to take off. People started changing the way they were buying their gifts. They were falling out of love with this of the month club concept. And as an entrepreneur, I said to myself, wait a minute, the world is changing. I need to adapt. I need to adjust and react how I'm, fa how I'm facing my customers. Kind of like what you're doing in the real estate business. The world has changed, as we know, in the real estate world. And those who are agile, those who adjust, those who innovate are the ones who survive. So I slowly started phasing myself out of that of the month club concept, still staying in the cigar business, but just changing the way I sold my product to the customers. We started selling to casinos and resorts and country clubs. And thank God we did because my competitors who were doing the beer of the month and the wine of the month, they stayed in that comfort zone. They'd been doing the same thing for years and years and years, and they wound up filing for bankruptcy because the world changed and they didn't. So I was able to sell that company uh, about 10 years ago. And just as I had sold that company, uh, I got approached to do this reality show with Donald Trump. This friend of mine, her mother had called me up and she said, there's a new show with Trump and they're looking for young entrepreneurs to compete. And if you win, you can become his right hand man. I said, it sounds rather interesting. Uh, can you send me an email about what this is all about? I'd like to take a look at it. She said, no, Bill, actually I can't. I made you an appointment on Wednesday at one o'clock. You better be there. It was a tough lady. So I go to this meeting and I sit down with these producers in Hollywood and they start explaining the concept of this show, The Apprentice. We're gonna be starting a new business from scratch each week and there's a winning team and a losing team. And they had 250,000 people apply, right? And they narrowed it down to 50. And they took the final 50 and they flew us all to Los Angeles and, and they put us through a battery of testing. And then at the end of the week, uh, I got called into a room with a guy named Mark Burnett. You guys know who he is? He's created a lot of these reality shows. Well, he offered me the, the last spot uh, to compete. I was the 16th contestant chosen to compete on that first season. And he said, there's just two conditions if you're gonna do this. One, you have to wrap up all your business in Chicago and be in New York, and you've got two weeks to do it. And the second condition is you cannot tell a soul where you're going to be for the 13 weeks that you're competing on this competition. Uh, this was the first season of the show. Everything was very secretive. They didn't want any of the, the, the ideas to get out. He said, but don't worry, we've got some of the best producers in Hollywood, they're in the room right next door, and they're gonna create a story for you to tell people where you're at for these 13 weeks, so no one is suspicious or hot on your trail about what you're doing. I said, okay, sounds a little different, but all right, I'll go with it. So I get it from that meeting, and I go into the room right next door, and I meet with these top producers from Hollywood, and they created a story for me to tell people, and the story was that I was going to be relocating to Havana, Cuba, to buy tobacco fields, and I would have no contact with the outside world. <laughs> These are the best producers in Hollywood? I'm a US citizen, man. I can't go to Cuba, it's against the law. I thought that was pretty amusing. But what I found more amusing is my buddies actually believed the story. I thought I used to hang out with some sharp guys. So I get to New York and I'm ready to take on the, the big business of Manhattan. And we get saddled with our first task. And our first task is probably something that each and every one of you have done at some point in your careers. It was to sell lemonade. We had to open up lemonade stands. 
And I thought, oh my God, this is the end of my career. I'm in midtown Manhattan in a suit and tie selling lemonade. I'm done. But then the tasks got larger and they got a lot more complicated and the sleep deprivation started kicking in and the innovation really took over. Those who could innovate, those who could find new ways to approach these businesses were the ones who survived week after week. And then before I knew it, I looked to my right and I looked to my left and there was just one other person still standing there. And it was just my luck, this guy happened to have his MBA from Harvard. So it was the, the, the entrepreneur real estate developer from Chicago versus the Harvard MBA. And we battled it out in this final round. I had to run a, a celebrity golf tournament. He had to run the celebrity rock concert. And then it came the moment of truth. We got called into this final boardroom with Trump. And there were 28 million people tuning in. It was on live national television. And Trump made his decision. And he hired me on. It was a, a great night for me. It was a lot of hard work that it paid off. But my celebration was short-lived because I was immediately whisked away and I was taken on a two-week tour of all these talk shows. You know, Larry King, and Jay Leno, and the Today Show. Where were those people 15 years ago when I was stuck doing Danny Bonaducci? Well, they all wanted me on their show. And I finished my tour and I made my way back home and I was sitting in my family room and it was the first time I'd experienced any peace or quiet in literally months. And I remember thinking to myself, why me? You know, what separated me from the pack of all these people who wanted to win this? There were 250,000 people who applied. And I think, really, there were three main reasons, and I think these are why people are successful, especially in the real estate business. One, it's a term called practical execution. In the real world, it's about getting the job done. And in the real estate business especially, I've been in it a long time now, people talk one hell of a game, don't they? They're gonna accomplish this, they're gonna do this, they're gonna you know, sell X amount this year. They don't do it. And on The Apprentice, I understood the value of that. I kept my mouth shut, I put my head down, and I let my actions speak for me. And I think that's important. Secondly, it's about agility. Agility is probably the best trait we can bring to the table in the real estate business. Yet so many of us are oblivious to it. So many of us have those blinders on, they stay in that comfort zone, you know, they've been doing this for 20 years, 30 years, and that's the way they're going to continue to do this. On The Apprentice, had I not been agile, I would have been in real trouble. You see, on the final task of that show, we had to hire back the people who were just fired. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. These people were just fired. They wanted to be where I'm at. I've got to adjust the way I manage them. I can't use a traditional management style when approaching this. And I became a micromanager double and triple checked everything they did. My competitor who went to Harvard, very smart guy, he did it the way the Harvard textbook taught him. And he followed that Harvard textbook to the letter of the law. But the Harvard textbook forgot about one person. He had a, a young lady on his team by the name of Omarosa. You guys remember her by chance? And she sabotaged everything he did. I mean, booby trapped everything. It was just not a good situation. But had he been agile, had he adjusted it and reacted to that a little bit, he would have been in a better situation, but he didn't. So it's about practical execution, it's about agility, and lastly, it's about risk. It's about understanding risk, respecting risk, and converting risk into success. Success is a funny word, and obviously everyone in this room is successful, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But I often wonder, you know, why are some people successful and most people not? And for me, it comes down to one word and that word is fear. I don't know if you knew this, but when we're born into the world, we're only born with two natural fears. The fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. And every other fear we have is learned. And so many people are afraid they're gonna fail, they're afraid they're gonna make a mistake, they're afraid what their friends or colleagues are gonna say, but they never even try. I think Emerson said it best when he said, always, always, always do what you are afraid to do and you will find success. You know, the Coke bottle glasses, I, I asked you know, so many people, where is your version of that? You know, you have a version of that, it may not be the Coke bottle glasses, but are you doing everything you can to brand yourself, brand your business? You know, are the people in the community turning to you as the expert? You know, are you utilizing all the resources that are out there? Maybe non-traditional ways, you know, especially in the real estate business. In this time, I often wonder why aren't more people you know, going on these radio shows, offering their expertise. If you've been in the business 10, 20, 30 years, you know, these radio shows and these local TV shows are looking for content to help their viewers and the people in their community. 
well, what are you doing to put yourself at the front of the pack? It's amazing. I, I used to work with a girl on The Apprentice, this girl, Katrina Campins. She was on the show with us. And she is selling hundreds of millions of dollars a year in real estate. But she's branded herself. She's on the local TV shows, the local talk shows in Miami. And she's done an incredible job of doing it. But she didn't have any fear. She put herself out there. She took a risk. And she left the fear at home. I know all about fear, by the way. When I first got hired on by Trump to build this high rise in Chicago with him, I was terrified. I thought, I've got to spend the next three years building this high rise with Trump. I'm going to be a dead man. And then Trump called me on my cell phone about two weeks after I won. And it was the call that I claim really set the tempo for our, our relationship. He called me up. He said, Bill Donald here. He said, I need you to do me a favor. I said, of course, whatever you need. He said, I need you to get on my plane with me tomorrow and fly with me to Quito, Ecuador, because I want you to be a judge at my Miss Universe contest. I said, Donald, I'm a company man. I will do whatever I need to do to help this organization. But I have to give him credit because, um, you know, when I first won this show, I thought I'm probably never going to see this guy again. You know, this was a TV show and that's it. But that wasn't the case. He held up his end of the bargain. He took me under his wing. He showed me what business is like at that level. And I don't know if you've worked with billionaires before, but it's a, it's a pretty fascinating environment. And, and I, I really watched and, and, and learned from him a lot. And, and I realized that business at his level isn't much different than business at our level. The numbers may be a lot larger, but the truly successful people are the ones who can understand and master the fundamentals of business. And they use those as their foundation. Just like when you build a high rise, if you've got the right foundation set, caissons are in, it's ready to go, you can build almost you know, infinitely number of stories. So for me, I was put in charge of working on a building in Chicago, but first I had to go work on a high rise in White Plains in New York, because I'd never built a high rise before, and I was going to White Plains to learn how these things are built. And I had to shadow a fellow who was the chairman of a major construction company. He was this big guy from Brooklyn. You want to talk about fear. This guy had a stick Brooklyn accent. He worked in the construction business. This is when the Sopranos TV show was popular. So I was terrified going into work the first five days I was there. I thought, I'm never going to make it out of here. But it turned out he was a, a brilliant uh, businessman. He was really brilliant in the real estate business. And he taught me a very valuable lesson about real estate. And I was in about, I don't know, six or seven days on the job. And I was in over my head. And I was leaving the office one day, and he turned to me, and he said, hey, kid, he said, be the conductor. And I looked at him, and I said, okay, we'll do. And I left there, and I had no idea what he was talking about. I was just afraid of the guy. And I, I got back in the car, and I'm riding back into Manhattan, and I'm thinking to myself, be the conductor. What was this guy getting? Was he looking at the conductor of a locomotive? Where was he going? And then it hit me. He was referring to the conductor of an orchestra. So the conductor of an orchestra has all these expert musicians in his or her pit, and they play their instruments to absolute perfection. The conductor himself is not an expert at playing each and every one of those instruments. The moral of the story is that so many of us don't know how to conduct. So many of us let our egos get in the way. I sold $100 million in real estate last year. I know what I'm doing. You know, we stunt our growth. The successful ones are the ones who say, wait a minute, maybe there's a, a more innovative way where I can take that 100 million and make it 200 million in sales. Am I relying on experts out there? Like when you build a high rise, you know, the developer himself needs to conduct. He's got engineers and architects and HVAC specialists, and he gets them all to play in harmony with one another. And that's what we have to do in our lives. We have to learn how to conduct. We've got to play that music. And I think part of being a conductor is being able to look outside and say, wait a minute, you know, there are other people who may be better at this than I am, who may be smarter, who can maybe teach me a more strategic or innovative way. And one thing I, I've learned to do since I've been conducting is I've learned to do a lot of people watching. Any people watchers in the room? Right? I think you can learn so much good and bad by watching people. And for me, I've been lucky because I've been around some, some pretty successful people. Obviously, I spent a lot of time with Trump and I've spent some time with you know, Mark Cuban and I went to uh, Malaysia many years back with Neil Armstrong, the astronaut, God rest his soul, but he was a, a very amazing entrepreneur, most people don't know. And, and I just would watch these guys. I love people watching. And I realized that although these guys have completely different personalities, they all have almost identical traits. And these are traits that I try to emulate. One, 
they're all good decision makers. This may seem very fundamental to some of you, but the majority of the people have a very difficult time making decisions and making decisions in a timely manner, and they let opportunities pass them by. And early on, I'll never forget, Trump pulled me aside when I was in Chicago working on that project, and he said, I'll support you, right or wrong, whatever decision you make, but the day you don't make a decision is the day I'm gonna fire you. So these guys are all good decision makers. Secondly, they're all creative. They find creative ways to market themselves and market their products. Look at Richard Branson. You look at all these guys who are at the top of their field, they're finding new and innovative ways to market themselves. Trump is a prime example. You know, had I not sold those Coke bottle glasses to the radio stations in the beginning, you know, maybe I wouldn't be here today. But I was finding a creative way to get my word out. So they're good decision makers, they're creative, and lastly, and probably the most important trait they have, is they all have that never quit, never make excuse mindset. And so many people in the real estate business, as soon as things get tough or they, they reach a, an impasse, the first thing they do is they point to their left and they point to their right and they blame the person on either side. The successful ones are the ones who take the finger and they point at themselves. You look at Trump in the early 90s, right? This guy was billions of dollars in debt. Everyone had written him off. No one would even return his phone calls, right? But he didn't give up. He found creative ways to restructure things. He fought and he fought and he fought. And if you look at him today, whether you love him or hate him, he's at the highest point he's ever been in his career. He's got buildings going up everywhere. He's licensing his name and his products. But he didn't give up. By the way, he remembers each and every person who wouldn't return his call in this day and age. He forgives, but he didn't forget. So they're good decision makers, they're creative, and they adopt that never quit, never make excuse mindset. So I've been very fortunate to spend a lot of time with great innovators, with very successful entrepreneurs. And then I just finished working on a show for the a &E Network called We Mean Business. And it's a show where I get to go in and, and help entrepreneurs who are struggling. And I did a lot of people watching while I filmed these 10 episodes and, and really learned a lot from these people. And, and I, again, I realized that they all have different personalities, but these people all have identical traits. And if these are traits we have, we may want to take a closer look at how we're doing business. One, it's probably the most common trait I see in, in people who are, are not succeeding in business. They're reactive rather than proactive. You probably know a lot of people like this. They wait for the problems to arise and, and then they put those fires out and they love that drama in their lives. It's amazing. The successful ones are the ones who are anticipating the problems and bringing their customers solutions before the problem even arises. Those are the people who are at the top of their game. Secondly, all these people surround themselves around negative people. It is remarkable. An interesting study, I think it was the University of Chicago, it came out and said the majority of the people we come into contact with on a daily basis are negative. It went on to say that you're never gonna be able to eliminate those people from your lives, but if you're aware of who they are and what their intentions are, you negate their power. And I think as you go through life, and everyone in this room is at the top of their game, there's always gonna be those people who feel the need to pull you down in order to build themselves up. There's always gonna be those people who are jealous, who wish they had your ambition, they wish they had your, your drive and, and your determination, but they don't, and they're gonna pull you down. You know, speaking of that, I, I ran into the two owners of that metals company. I was at a charity event about two years ago, and, and these guys came running up to me, and they said, we knew you were gonna be successful, Rancic. I'm not so sure about that, buddy. So, reactive rather than proactive, Surrounding themselves around negative people, and lastly, and probably most importantly, it's about potential. And I think these people who aren't doing well, and the majority of the people, they don't realize the potential they have. And potential as an entrepreneur is probably the best God-given asset we have, yet it's the most underutilized. And I really believe that when we're born into the world, we're given a certain amount of currency in the form of potential. And it's up to us to make it grow, it's up to us to make it multiply. And so many people don't do anything with it. And I want to end with the story. We're going to get to some Q&A in a minute. But I was reading this article the other day. Actually, it was a book. And this fellow has a very interesting perspective on the power of potential. And I thought it was fitting for this group. Uh, the gentleman writes, I heard somebody say the wealthiest place on earth is not Fort Knox or the oil fields in the Middle East. Nor is it the gold and diamond mines in South Africa. Ironically, 
the wealthiest places on earth are the cemeteries. Because lying in those graves are all kinds of dreams and desires that will never be fulfilled. Buried beneath the ground are books that will never be written, businesses that will never be started, and relationships that will never be formed. Sadly, the incredible power of potential is lying in those graves. So it's up to us not to bury that potential. It's up to us to be agile, to adopt that never quit, never make excuse mindset. And most importantly, we have to reverse engineer our lives. You know, we're coming up on the year 2013. You gotta close your eyes and you gotta envision 10 years from now. You know, are you gonna be happy with where you're at? With what you're doing today, is it gonna get you to where you wanna be in 2013? Because you don't wanna look back and you don't wanna have regrets. So I always end with this, and it's very fitting, especially in the real estate world. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. I want to thank you folks for having me here today. Thank you. And we're, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. If anyone has any questions, I think this young lady has a mic, or you can just raise your hand. It's a small enough room. Anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Hello. Hi. Um, of all of the things that you're involved in, what area is your favorite? Oh, wow. Um, you know, we, we're, we're recently in the restaurant business. We, uh, we're in the process of uh, opening up two more restaurants, one here in Las Vegas and, and another one in Chicago. Uh, and that's fun. Uh, you know, I have very good partners. I wish I could take all the credit for the success, but uh, I've learned to, you know, surround myself, as we say in the, in the conductor uh, speech, you know, you got to surround yourself with the right people. But, but so far, that, that's pretty fun and it's exciting and it's new for me. But real estate at the end of the day is, is what I love, you know, I and mean, that's, that's the business I love. And, um, I learned a lot from Trump, you know, over the years, and, and I'm developing projects in Chicago as, as we speak. I mean, it's, it's a great time to be in this business. Anyone else? A quiet group here. In the back, you, yes, ma'am? I think we have this young lady in the back. and quitting the metals business and then cigars. And I remember vividly The Apprentice and certainly everybody's heart was with you and that sort of thing. But you were tagged and branded on that show as a real estate entrepreneur. So how did that happen coming out of the cigar business? Well, when I sold the business, uh, I started to develop real estate. And a buddy of mine, uh, convinced me to buy an apartment building that was decrepit and renovated. And I thought, okay, I've seen what this guy was doing. And I bought this building. It was a hot area of Chicago. And I started developing it. And uh, I was out one night for dinner. I'll never forget this. And my phone rings. And this guy says, hi, this is Tom from Busy Bee Board Up. Your building's on fire. Uh, when the firemen leave, do you want us to board up your building? I thought, oh, that's funny. I thought it was one of my buddies playing a joke on me. And I hung up. And Five minutes later, another board of company calls me and said, your building's on fire. I mean, these guys are animals. I don't know if you ever dealt with them. They have the scanners, and they just park themselves outside these fires. And I got in a cab. I excused myself from the dinner date I was on, and I took a cab over to this place. And I got about two blocks from the building, and, and the streets were shut down. And there was a hook and ladder truck, and the building essentially burned up. And I bought the insurance, uh, the builder's risk, from a buddy of mine that I went to college with. Big mistake. And he didn't sell me the right insurance. And I learned a lot about actual value versus replacement value. Uh, I know I'm going on and on, but you know, I found a creative way to, to turn it around. I thought I was gonna be bankrupt. I put all my money in this building that I made from selling the company. And uh, I decided to make up condos instead of apartments. And I, I just found a creative way to come out alive. And instead of saying I'm done, I went and bought another one and another one. Uh, and that was kind of how I got into it. And, and, then, and then Trump came calling. Uh, and that was it. And you know, I was able to kind of use my entrepreneurial skills on the show, but uh, it was all by just you know seizing opportunity and not being afraid. You know, I think that was the, the best trait my parents instilled in me as a kid was it was okay to make mistakes, it was okay to have failures, but it was never okay not to try. And I think you look at some of the way some of the kids today, and I see it in my own family, and these parents, 
you know, everything's got to be perfect. You know, you got to, you know, go to an endurance coach if you're not doing well on the football team. And craziest, the craziest things we're doing to these kids, we're ruining them because they're so afraid once they get out in the real world to make mistakes, to, to have these, you know, stumbles along the way that they don't even try. And I, I think we're killing the next generation. So I don't know if that even answered your question. I kind of went on. Sorry. Anyone else? Over here. Okay. Hi, I, I kind of noticed, I'm sorry I'm sounding like a cold, huh? I noticed that you, most of the businesses that you have, that you appear to have partners. I'm wondering if you can help me to identify maybe a characteristics of how you forge forward in making dis decisions on partnerships and what, what keeps you going with those partners? Well, I was never a smart guy and I knew I always had to have smarter people around me. Uh, and that was kind of what I, what I did. Um, you know, I knew my strengths and I knew my weaknesses. First started in the cigar business, I knew how to sell, I knew how to be a marketer, uh, but I wasn't strong in the operations side of it. So if I was going to make this business work, I needed a guy who was operationally strong and someone who could handle the books and, and all that. That was never my strong suit. So this friend of mine, John, was just finishing up his MBA. Uh, he was more the, the back of the house, I was more the, the, the front of the house, and that's how we did it. Um, and and I, I realized that you have to have people around you who, who are smarter than you. That's a fact. I mean, everyone I've ever come into contact with who's achieved the ultimate level, you know, whether they're billionaires or in that category, they've got a lot of smart people around them and, and they know that, you know, they don't know it all. Uh, and so many people go through life claiming to be know-it-alls. Those are the ones who never really get to where they want to go. Uh, they may feel good about themselves for the moment, but in the long-term scheme of things, they look back and they have regret. So for me, that was important. And the one thing I knew about the restaurant business is that I didn't know anything about the restaurant business. So we, we partnered up with someone who's very successful. They've been in the business 41 years, uh, and they've built amazing uh, chains. They, they created the Maggiano's brand. I don't know if any of you ever had Maggiano's. Uh, Mon Ami Gabi, Corner Bakeries. So that's my partner in the restaurant business, and they're, they're amazing people, and they're, they're honest. I've had some bad partners, too. You know, Trust me, they're not all success stories. Uh, <laughs> So I've had some, some people who are, you know, <coughs> underhanded and, and things like that. But, uh, you know, the majority of the time, it's, it's been good people. Uh, you learn to trust your gut instinct. A question. Um, Bill, you have so much going on in your life. And Juliana, your wife, I know, is really busy, too. Um, for all of us, everyone has been, I know, working extra hard over the past few years with all of the changes in the industry. Um, can you give us just a little bit of advice or your thoughts on how you make personal time and how you enjoy life aside from business also? Well, it's, it's tough. You know, you get these motivational speakers who say you can have it all and all this free time. That's a bunch of hoo-ha, you know. Something's got to give, you know, and, and when, you're, when you're in business for yourself and when you, you, know, you eat what you kill, so to speak, you know, you've got to, especially the last four years, you're working twice as hard for half the money. And that's called survival, you know. So it, it's not, there's always going to be times in, in your life that you're never going to have that balance. And, you know, you hope that the sacrifices are worth the reward. And you're, you may have to sacrifice a little personal time at home, but, hey, your kid's going to go to a good college because you're able to provide for them. You know, you, you've got to look at that, and everyone has to weigh that on their own. But uh, it, it doesn't exist. You know what I mean? It just doesn't. And, and, and all love these books what you are, do because we're working hard at it, so we might as well enjoy it. Yeah, if you yeah. love what you're doing, yeah. That's true. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I'd like to share a little bit of, about my story. Um, I used to work in radio in Philadelphia. Okay. And uh, we were doing uh, promotions at different clubs. And one night in the crowd was Danny Bonaducci. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, he was, you know how he is. He's just bouncing. He's a wild man. So I asked him, I said, are you doing anything? And he said, no. I said, why don't you stop by at the radio station and see if we can put you on the air. So we did that. And then next thing you know, the program director hired him to do a, sh to do a shift. And that was very successful. And um, I was a promotion director at, at the radio station. So I, I was bringing people on the frequency really well. And I looked at my 
pocketbook and I said, you know, Arbitrons are going up. We're bringing people to frequency. We're selling a lot of ads, but yet I'm not making the bucks. So I got involved into investing into restaurants. One needed to many and started a franchise. And um, the way we went about it, I didn't have a budget either. So we went to the radio stations, brought them a bunch of food, and we talked about it, morning show, and we did a, we did a lot of different uh, contests, contests uh, that brought um, over 5,000, 6,000 people in the room. So it, it, it grew really big in Philadelphia. That's amazing. Amazing. I, what, what I didn't tell you about Danny Bonaduce, yeah. I'll give you a quick, quick synopsis of this. They said that they were going to have me on this TV show to feature my products on the Unique Gifts of the Holiday Show. So I said, great. So I go in there and I sit down with these producers and, and they immediately start negotiating. With me. I said, Bill, we'll, we'll put your products on our Unique Gifts for the Holiday Show. But we want you to do our eligible bachelor show in return. Right? I'm like, oh shit, this isn't going to be good. So I counter offer the woman back. I said, I'll do it, but on one condition. I get to bring my buddy Carson on the show with me. He was an eligible bachelor at the time. I wanted to have someone to share this wonderful experience with me. Right? And they agree, and, and I call up Carson, and he's on, because they, you know, they said they were going to be fixing us up with these models from Paris. They gave me the whole song and dance. So the day comes, we're going to film this show, and they send a limousine to pick us up. And I'd never been in a limousine until, until that day. And we're riding into the, the TV studio. We're high-fiving each other, thinking, damn, this is great. And I get there, and I'm there about a half hour, and I, and I realize why they had sent the limousine to pick us up. They were afraid that if we had driven ourselves, and we found out what the show was really titled, we'd be more likely to, to split on them. They changed the topic of the show to dateless and lonely for the holidays, right? <laughs> I'm like, my buddy Carson's running for the door. I'm grabbing him by the back of the shirt collar. Carson, you've got nothing to worry about, man. I need to get my products on the unique gifts for the holiday show. You gotta help a brother out. So he does. I, to this day, he still holds it over my head and he filmed the most humiliating show I've ever been on in my career. And they air that program Thanksgiving Day, right? No one's working. It's the highest rated show on the six week run of the Danny Bonaduce show. Uh, I, I you know, was getting harassed for a year about that, but sometimes you gotta do things that you, you don't wanna do in order to get the sale, right? I mean, you gotta leave your comfort zone. So, that's a small world. About but the moral, moral of the story is, I left the restaurant business and I said, I'll do jail time before I do any other restaurant. <laughs> oh, you didn't <laughs> like the opera. business? Well, no, it was fun and we did it. I did it for about eight years very successful, sold it and got involved in real estate. Exactly what you were doing, yeah. uh, rehabbing and selling. And discovered Phoenix, Arizona and moved there, what to do, what to do, took a license. But getting creative when the market was, was going down, I looked at options as you know owner carries and uh, wraps and other ways other than short sale to keep the values up and save a client. And, and uh, here we are today, getting more creative. Yeah. And uh, Concierge Auction has been great to what they brought uh, to the table. Well, they just sold an amazing piece of land right down the street from my house, like 102 acres, and they fetched a pretty handsome price in, in Brentwood, California. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm a believer in it. You know, I think, I think it's a great way to, to market things a little bit differently in a non-traditional way that's very effective. So, and they didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> Anyone else? Going, going, so thank you guys. Hey everyone. Um, hello, thank you Bill, that was great. So we have an hour with Bill meet and greet here in the room. We have some drinks that are gonna be served and then everyone can take time before meeting at the front entrance to Mandalay Bay was going to be 5:45. We're going to be. We're going to give a little more time. So six o'clock sharp. We need to leave because we need to get to Tao for dinner. So entrance to Mandalay Bay by six o'clock. We have fun transportation. I'll just put it that way. It'll take us there. Okay. See everyone then.